at about six years old, I had a very important moment in my life when uh, one of the other kids in kindergarten had their birthday and the kids were talking about, you know, how long a year is and, you know, it's so much time. And I suddenly realized like, no, it's, it's not long at all. Got a sense of urgency of, oh, I need to do something with my life. So, and I realized, oh, I can be maybe one thing. So then I learned, okay, I'm good at that. Maybe I can, maybe I can do something out of it. But I questioned, you know, why do I have to experience so much negativity? If you want to have peace, you need to prepare for war. And started practicing a lot of quite obscure practices for a young man. I started meditating and I was, uh, I was kind of, um, I'm thinking about if I would like to share that piece. But maybe I should. So I was... Welcome to another episode of the Max Hark podcast. Today with a special guest, Peter Mettler. Welcome. And Peter is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, third degree, Gracie Jiu Jitsu black belt, third degree world champion grappling, European champion grappling, European champion MMA. Uh, Peter won over 2000 fights on four continents in 30 countries. There are a lot of more accomplishments. I don't want to read them all, but welcome and I'm glad you're here and we made it. Me too. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You are or you were also my BJJ trainer, teacher. So I went to your classes, I think four or five times <laughs> <laughs> so far, hopefully more in the future. Um, but I always felt very welcome, very safe. I had a lot of fun and joy training, rolling in your dojo with your students, with you. And I really felt you, you really have a passion for teaching. Um, and yeah, when I found out you were just 33 years old, like I am, I was pretty amazed by what you've accomplished in life. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit, how did you become Peter Mettler today and what brought you that far? Well, I think it was a, it was a fairly long process of 33 years, as you mentioned. And uh, I started martial arts very early on at about three years old when my older brother started doing Japanese Jiu Jitsu and we started training at home. I grew up on a Swiss mountain farm up in the mountain hill. So we started training a lot. And as mentioned earlier, at about six years old, I had a very important, I wouldn't say enlightening, but a very important moment in my life when uh, one of the other kids in kindergarten had their birthday and the kids were talking about, you know, how long a year is and, you know, it's so much time. And I suddenly realized like, no, it's, it's not long at all. Like, wow, like life is but 80 years. And just mm -hmm. the day before we were thinking about, you know, Jesus walked the earth 2000 years ago. So we oversee a much longer span of time and, Dinosaurs were like 65 million years and I'm like, wow, 80 years is, it's mm -hmm. nothing. It's life is so short. And I, I got a sense of urgency of, oh, I need to do something with my life. Before I was thinking that I can have, you know, like, like a child's dream, several different things. I wanted to be an astronaut and maybe a doctor and an engineer and all that different things. And I realized, oh, I can be maybe one thing and was thinking about what was the most awesome thing that I could do with my life. How could I get the most out of it? The most interesting, the most experienced, the most useful thing that I could do. And I thought about that the coolest people that I knew at that time were those martial arts masters, you know, like mm -hmm. a Shaolin who's physically very strong and he can help the people who cannot defend themselves. But he's also a very intelligent, very educated man. And I wanted to combine those two things. And I thought, oh, if I'm a martial arts master, then I can fight, I can travel the world, I can teach people, you know, I can mm -hmm. 
become a master of body and mind and I decided at that day, okay, I want to become a martial arts master. And you were six years old in that yes. moment, so yeah. definitely not a normal six-year-old. Yeah, I, I realize that now when I'm teaching kids and I realize, okay, like the six years old that I see or even the 12 or 15 years old, I was definitely different than mm -hmm. most of the kids that I see. Yeah, you had already a very clear vision for your life and you also understood what it means, martial arts, that it's mm -hmm. not just the brute force fighting, mm -hmm. but also has other components that you just mentioned to it. Definitely. I think that's what brings most people to the martial arts. The other part or the holistic approach? I think so. Mm -hmm. For some of them, it's the idea of defending themselves. Mm -hmm. And for many, many more people, even it's the idea of developing your body and the mind equally. Mm. Yeah, so true. Maybe I, I'll share a bit why I started BJJ with you. Um, obviously, I watched Joe Rogan. I think everyone do, does in BJJ. <laughs> so some years ago I heard about BJJ mm -hmm. and I always had the idea, oh, that would be cool to start. And I started to have friends who were doing BJJ. Mm -hmm. And those friends who were doing BJJ, I also found, wow, they have a presence. Like they feel, they feel whole. Mm -hmm. They're not just strong people that bully other people and they don't bully. But they also have an open heart. So they're like strong men, but with an open heart. Mm -hmm. And they seem balanced and healthy people. Um, so I, I always felt that inspiration to start it. Um, but I also came from a physically weak place. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, I started working with Nico Becker mm -hmm. as my holistic health coach. And Nico also was one of your students some years ago. Um, Yeah, and he really teached me kettlebell training, nutrition, holistic health, and I became stronger and stronger through that. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, I still had this excuse. Oh, I feel I want to be more strong. I want to work out with two 16 kilogram kettlebells before I go to BJJ. Mm -hmm. um, and some months ago, Alexandra told me, hey, Max, you tell me this for two years now. You want to do BJJ? Just go now. I was like, yeah. Actually, why not just try it out? And yeah, I went to your class, as I mentioned earlier, I felt very welcome as a newbie, very safe. And was so much fun, so much joy, because I didn't have this part in my life before this physical, I would say controlled aggressiveness mm -hmm. to really live, live that out, that physical, like, okay, who's stronger? Who can survive? Like we are fighting for survival in a safe way while we roll on the mat and training this brought up a lot of joy and fun in me and I also felt very grounded and it activated my yang energy because energy, mm -hmm. naturally I'm more this yin type of guy coming from all the spiritual mm -hmm. traditions and practices and yeah I really feel how it balanced me out and activated my yang energy so I'm really drawn to continue this path wherever I travel I will sign up for BJJ yeah, and continue this. It's awesome. That's a thing that I really love about the martial arts is that it has this twofold path. You know, it's a lot of times it's a bit about the person. So one half of the people doing martial arts have an, we could say an overflow of yang energy. They have too much energy. And in our society, there is no way to go. There's nowhere to go with that energy. Mm -hmm. From a very young age on, you're taught to be sitting still, be quiet. Uh, girls are very much preferred in school for the higher ability of doing that. And so the boys very often feel rejected because they are. A big part of what they are is being openly rejected. No, don't be loud. No, mm -hmm. don't have that energy. You know, hold back, contain yourself. And the martial art allows you to channel that kind of energy into something fruitful. Even competition is welcome. You can go to a competition, you can fight another man. You can prove yourself in that fight. And to me, it's important to understand that it's not even about winning or losing. It's about having the guts, so mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. to stand and fight. 
and the other half of martial arts is increasing that yang energy, increasing that strength, because big parts of our society today are completely removed from that physical plane, from that physical confrontation. Mm -hmm. They are not aware of it that even today in any interaction between humans, the physical part plays a role. And even that physical competitiveness plays a role. I see that very often that people unconsciously react to it. They raise their voice, which is already, it, it, it's an act of violence. It's mm -hmm. an act of threat, right? Yeah. They try to make themselves bigger and all that stuff. And I think to increase the ability to channel your yang energy or to withstand another man or another woman is a very important part of martial arts. And now to combine those two things is mm -hmm. the ultimate purpose of it. Yeah. And when I looked at your YouTube, and I think you also share a lot of TikTok videos, <laughs> um, which you also didn't share on YouTube, mm -hmm. you, you really display and show, I think, the yin and the yang, because you also talk about spiritual topics mm -hmm. and meditation, like other sides of, BJJ or MMA, um, yeah. So, so you really seem like a holistic person, a holistic teacher, trainer, fighter. Maybe you can can share a bit about that. How did you got into you know both sides of that? Um, coming back, you were six years old. How did you further go on your path, and where did you see maybe the spiritual or the Yin aspect coming into your life? It's a great question. I. I was raised Christian. I'm a Christian believer. I'm very faithful. So a big part of my life I was questioning, you know, why? Because I had a, a very hard time. I have ADHD. I, I don't know if you know that. So I have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So that means that neurotypical people, they can direct their attention wherever they please. And uh, I with ADHD, I'm much more like a dog. What, whatever, you know, whatever takes my attention has my attention. Mm -hmm. And it's the slightest sound, the slightest change in environment just takes my attention. But if something bores me, I am absolutely incapable of directing my attention at it, which is obviously horrible in school. And for that being different, I was being bullied quite harshly in a kindergarten already. And I was making quite big problems at home too for my mother who had to raise four children. So I was, uh, I was experiencing quite a hard time by that. But in kindergarten, <laughs> as I said, uh, when kids were trying to fight me and I realized, oh, I'm being used to being hit by an adult. Mm. So like whatever those kids do to me, is, uh, so I experienced I quickly learned, oh, I'm much better at violence than them. So then I learned, okay, I'm good at that. Maybe I can, maybe I can do something mm -hmm. out of it. But I questioned, you know, why do I have to experience so much negativity, mm -hmm. so much pain, so much rejection? And uh, at one point I learned, it was about 10 or 11 years old, I learned uh, a wisdom, piece of wisdom that God does give everybody as much of a load as they can carry. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I even I would have said it differently then, mm -hmm. that he spares or gives the biggest loads, the heaviest loads to the strongest people. Mm -hmm. And that helped developing me uh, a self-image of being stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, that helped me become much more resilient. That, that's a pretty deep truth, I think. Yeah. I remember uh, Marcus Aurelius also talking about this, right? How oh. can you, how can you resist anything that happens in your life because you just experience what a human can experience, yeah. and it's normal for a human to experience whatever you experience. Yeah, yeah. he said, you know, is it bearable? Mm -hmm. Then bear it. Mm -hmm. so it it's fabulous. Uh, today, I would, I would say much different no, it's not about the size of the load or the weight it's just that every load is a bit different it's the load that fits your life and your purpose and i always i just wanted to be left in peace 
You know, I just didn't want the others to, to stress me. Why are you bullying me? Like, you gain nothing. And they realize, you know, they come, they bully me, I say, hey, stop, or I'm going to hit you. Mm -hmm. And they didn't stop, and I would hit them. And I was like, what's wrong with them? They know exactly what is going to happen. Now I understand they needed a confrontation for their life or whatever, but mm -hmm. I just didn't understand. And the teachers as well, why could they not just be peaceful towards me? Why all that antagonizing? Mm -hmm. So I learned the martial arts and the control over my mind as well to be able to be peaceful. Like the old Roman wisdom, civis pats and parabellum, if you want to have peace, you need to prepare for war. And today I, f I feel that very much in how I can move in society or in the world. It allows me to be much more at peace. It's a bit like with dogs. Because if you look at a chihuahua, like a small dog, they are always so aggressive. Mm -hmm. They bark, you know, like they wah, 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 because they need to. Mm -hmm. because everything is a threat to them and, and it is a threat to them you know you could accidentally step on them mm -hmm. but if you look like at a big dog a burner the a mm -hmm. swiss mountain dog they are so calm mm -hmm. or like with pit bulls even you know like a little child pulls on their tail and they're just like oh what's happening because they know yeah. at any time they could just boom mm -hmm. and that kind of self-image allows me to much more calmly move through life. Yeah. Because, and I think everybody who learns the martial art and BJJ and becomes good enough at it, mm -hmm. at least that's, that's my, I guess, dream <laughs> with it, to feel the confidence of like, okay, I can handle any situation even when there's an aggressive person. Mm -hmm. I know I could handle it and that radiates some peace and calmness mm -hmm. into the environment. I, I think many people that do martial arts, <laughs> I wouldn't say everybody, <laughs> because you have to actively seek that. Mm -hmm. It's not given to you, not even through strength. Because we see in reality that some of the most powerful fighters in the world lack that inner calmness. Mm. They're still they're bullies. They're still very immature. Like in Jiu-Jitsu, yeah. you know, Gordon Ryan and the way he behaves. I don't know. Him. I just thought of Conor McGregor. And or Conor McGregor. It, it's <laughs> obvious, right? <laughs> right. Like he's, at one point, he was undoubtedly pound for pound the strongest fighter in the world. And yet, he's so provoked by an old man refusing to take a shot of whiskey that he punches an old man unprovoked. That's why I told many people, and I would never want to switch places with him. Because what for? What, what use is it for him to be so strong, so powerful, so famous, so rich? But he's no one. Mm -hmm. But what do you think? How much of that bulliness or aggressionness or immaturity, how much of that is his personality versus how much of that is the marketing for the UFC to sell more fights and tickets. Is, is it a bit like that they play a bit of this? To have more tickets. I think sales? you cannot separate the two. The role you play is who you are. If I take a look at my father, he would never play such a role. Whatever you would offer to him, if it would be billions, he would not do it because he would think it's shameful, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you, you understand? Mm -hmm. And I would not play that role. Mm -hmm. Whatever that fame or richness has to offer to me does not compare to being myself. Mm -hmm. And for Conor McGregor, it does. It does. You give him a couple treats, couple million dollars and he's ready to do whatever it takes coming back to your life um, I don't know where we are yet six 12 years old yeah, about about 10 10 yeah. yeah please walk us through 
forward to so, becoming Peter Mettler today? Um, at a very young age, I studied not just a lot of martial arts, but I've read a lot of books as well, because I wanted to understand the world. I think everybody does. Everybody does. But I just stuck to it. I really wanted to understand why is the sky blue? Why mm -hmm. is grass green? Why do I need to sleep? Why am I? And who am I? And what am I? And how do I even think? And who is it that is thinking? So I, <laughs> I read hundreds and hundreds of books very early on and started practicing a lot of quite obscure practices for a young man. I started meditating, I started to... When did you start meditating? Well, at, at about the same age. Really? Like yeah. 10 years? No, at about uh, six or seven years. At, oh, wow. at that age, when, I, when uh -huh. I decided to become a master of martial arts, I decided to master myself. So I started meditating, I started trying out-of-body experiences, because I had a couple lucid dreams, and I was like, hey, what is that? Uh -huh. You know, like, you know lucid dreaming? Yeah, and I'm like, uh -huh. hey, that's something something very special. Mm -hmm. How can I experience the world out of my own body? I'm like, oh, that, that's something. There's a huge secret hidden in there. And uh, so I needed to know more about it. So I needed to read those books about, I needed to practice all those things. And uh, I needed to study the big masters of martial arts, like the Shaolin or like Bruce Lee, who has inspired millions. Mm -hmm. And I have been looking for my purpose a lot of not just mastering myself, but what value am I bringing to this world? What for am I living? It can't be that I just live here and then die. Mm -hmm. You know, and I didn't want to live like, like a tree who's just being here. Or like a, like a dog or it's just mm -hmm. experiencing and looking for the next experience. I wanted to be a human, somebody who brings value. And uh, I thought, okay, if I can teach the people martial arts and the mastering of their own body and mind, that will bring value, right? So I tried to become that, study the masters, and then I thought about, okay, if I want to inspire more people, then I need to reach more people. How can I make the people listen to me? And then I thought, okay, I, I would like to become uh, an actor for martial arts movies, but <laughs> obviously that <laughs> hasn't worked out. Or I could become maybe a famous fighter. I was like, okay, yeah, that would, that would be good too, mm -hmm. because fighters are very famous. And I was meditating and praying about it a lot and I started to share my goals with the first couple of people and uh, the response was that uh, you will never make it you know it's not possible and they told me oh no Peter you know how many people try and all of them fail and I'm like oh that's that's the first mistake you make most people don't try mm -hmm. they don't they think they do maybe but they don't even try they think about doing it, then they don't, because they are scared of failing. I think of the people that actually try, much more people succeed than not. And I was, uh, I was kind of, um, I'm thinking about if I would like to share that piece, but maybe I should. So I was, I was praying and I was kind of betting with God himself mm -hmm. to say, if you allow me to become world champion one day, I will work for your kingdom. I will try to do my best in this world. And uh, so I went on that path, trying to become world champion of martial arts because I thought, oh, that's the biggest thing that I could be in the martial arts, a world champion. So I started to compete at about 14 years old. Then I, I trained in Schwyz at first. And at one day I met a man in competition and many times when you're young and you win competitions everybody comes to you oh mm -hmm. come to my dojo come to my dojo but that man had a certain kind of energy it was different i wanted to go there to see what are they doing and i went there 
and it was insane. It was a completely different level that I have never seen before. And I was like, wow, this is where I need to be. And I thought about it long and hard. And it was uh, 2006, so it was a uh, uh, eight mile. The movie it was, was mm -hmm. kind of fresh. And so the, I remembered, okay, if you had one shot, one opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I thought about, okay, if I'm old, what will be important? I like to remember that, to look at my life. How are my ancestors looking at me? like my grandparents in heaven and how or other people who are maybe dead looking at me, how is my life from the outside? And when I'm old, 80 years old in my rocking chair, so God wills I have kids and grandchildren and I tell them my stories and I reflect about my life, what is it that I want to say about my life? And what many people say is, oh, had I just, mm -hmm. if I just had, and I decided I will never want to say that. I will want to say I have tried. I have given my best. So I tried. I stopped my apprenticeship. I moved out of home. So you had like a normal job, apprenticeship? Yeah, yeah. yeah I started an apprenticeship <laughs> after, uh, after school. It was a difficult time in school, obviously. And at first I wanted to go study physics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was being... Um, told that no in in university you will not have the motivated people as well they told me it will be the same as in school and i'm like oh man <laughs> no i just want to go to work mm -hmm. but that was a bad decision i hated working i hated it it was horrible uh, every day after a couple months of working every day i was crying in the morning for having mm. to go to work same day eight hours every day same day early in the morning uh, it's called automatic so it's okay. basically building auto automation like the people who build robots in factories mm -hmm. that's automation okay. or even just the, the steering of the, the window shades mm -hmm. because i thought it's a very broad kind of way of learning to learn some mechanics some electricity mm -hmm. you know and i thought okay it will be interesting but it wasn't it was boring and it was it was horrible mm -hmm. and i remember what really you know the the epitome of that bad spirit is you know we do it like that for 30 years i'm like man and you think that's a good thing you know hey you think that's a brag so in 30 years None of you people ever found a single way of improving that. And you think that's a brag? I would never say somebody. Mm -hmm. I would tell them, oh, huh, just yesterday we implemented that new method and we're trying it now. No, but they're like, oh, 30 years, exactly the same. I'm like, oh, wow. So I stopped that. Mm -hmm. I stopped that. It was, a, it was a very important decision. I moved mm -hmm. out of my home. I was like, I think 15 about and I moved into the dojo I lived under the boxing ring and I just thought okay that's my one shot in life that I need to take like I think it was Albert Einstein who said that the secret to success is to bet everything on one card and then be ready to just let go of it all and bet everything off on a new card mm -hmm. and I did just that started training there every day all day no money no nothing just living there training competing every weekend hmm. wow. so you were making that deal with god mm -hmm. basically basically yeah. <laughs> to to serve the, his mm -hmm. kingdom mm -hmm. and then really the right person appeared in front of you mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. maybe the universe or God gave you a little test, like, hey, do you take, do you take this card now and put everything on mm -hmm. it and do you go all in? So how did you continue then? You were 15 years old in this new gym competing every weekend. What made you more successful than other people who tried? How did you really be so successful? And I think you already a lot of that came through like you had a very clear vision mm -hmm. and you were like really 
okay, I'm living on the edge, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. But what, what made you still much more successful than other people who tried? I think the most important factor, because people who are successful always like to tell you they just worked a lot harder than others. And it's not that. Everybody works hard. You know, my father works hard. No, no, <laughs> now he's retired, but he used to work hard. You know, somebody picking up trash works harder than I ever could. But somehow he's not a millionaire. So it's not hard work. That's just those people trying to justify themselves or trying to elevate themselves. I firmly believe that everybody of us has a purpose given to them by God. You're sent here with a purpose. Maybe you have chosen that in time before, but that's, that's a spiritual question. But you have a purpose and you have two more things. You have everything it takes to fulfill that purpose. You have the physical and the mental setup for exactly that purpose. And you have the deeply rooted inner desire. Because like a plant who's growing, they want to grow, you know, they, they reach up to the sky. And it's the same with us. If you are good at something, you feel that, you enjoy it, you want to go deeper into it. So I think that is, that is the key. Find what you're made to do. Do not let others distract you from it too much. Because they will try to. Most of them out of fear, some fear for you, like your parents, maybe fear, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> like my parents feared for me. But my father was very supportive. He was like, oh, oh, that boy is going on a wild ride. But he was trusting that, okay, God is sending him on that ride and he made him prepared for it. And others are scared that you are showing them that they have gone wrong. You show them what's actually possible. Yeah, exactly. It's like, mm -hmm. the, it's like the crabs in a bucket, you know, mm -hmm. like if one tries to crawl out, they pull them back. Mm -hmm. But if you really find what you're good at and, and the very important and difficult thing is to accept that every purpose is equal and equally important. I really like to talk about the people who clean, you know, like clean toilets and stuff because I'm very bad at it and I hate it. So I really appreciate, I really appreciate that there are clean toilets. Everybody appreciates a clean <laughs> toilet, right? But we don't appreciate the toilet cleaner. Mm -hmm. We appreciate the guy driving around in a Ferrari, but he does nothing for me. But the man who's cleaning the toilet, he does a lot for me. Mm -hmm. And if those people realize that the purpose is equally important, equally beautiful, you know, equally, um, well, yeah, important, beautiful, and of sense of meaning, then you can really find your purpose. I think there's a lot of lawyers who should be taxi drivers, mm -hmm. you know, but they're pushed to be lawyers. They're pushed to be there. People tell them, oh, if you, you know, if you really let go of all joy, and really put all your butt into it and study very hard, mm -hmm. then you can be in that position and be miserable for the rest of your life. <laughs> yes. But people will tell you you're good. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. A lot of taxi drivers should be artists. Some of the best art that could have been is not here. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the secret to success, to not let other people define what is success because success does not need to be money. It can be, but it doesn't need to be. And then I repeat myself to find what are you made to do? What mm -hmm. is your purpose? And yeah. then do that. Yeah. yeah. And it seems that so many people, uh, including myself, I could see this now with my big life changes that I'm going through in the last months. We have this personality. I have this idea that here's Max and Max has this ego, this personality. Mm -hmm. And there were parts. So 
I mean, I quit my job. I, I'm in the process of transforming my relationship with my ex-partner, moving out of this beautiful home here. And I could see there are parts that, like my inner child who would like everything to stay safe and stay the same, have mm -hmm. the stable income, have the relationship that is maybe not the most fulfilling one or not the most supporting for my purpose at this time, but it's very predictable and very mm -hmm. safe. Uh, have the safe home where I know I have my practices, my routines. Mm -hmm. Don't do crazy stuff like moving to another country, working in a new job or something like that. And I could see how my inner part, and I think most people have these inner parts that are holding them back. Of course, yeah, there was my inner child of like, huh, I like the safety, the security, the predictability of everything. Mm -hmm. But I could also feel into another part, maybe my inner hero or mm -hmm. the awakened part inside of Max who always felt like, no, I want to share a podcast on awakening. Mm -hmm. I want to talk with interesting people in Europe and share all the interesting people here that talk about awakening that seem to have a divine purpose in a sense and share that with the world through this podcast. And yeah, I can totally resonate with what you shared about your life and that it is a huge part of success. Mm -hmm. And I also had to think about David Data, where he speaks about a man should live on his edge where He's not burning himself out by doing too crazy stuff, but where he's not living too comfortably in the day-to-day -day life and thereby missing his true purpose. Mm -hmm. And this true purpose can also change over the life. So there are layers of it that chat over mm -hmm. time. And we also have to ask ourselves, I think, constantly maybe, or at least every once in a while, am I still on the edge? Am I still living my purpose? Is this mm -hmm. still my purpose, what I'm doing now? And I could just see in the last few months a lot of things just showed themselves as not being aligned anymore for me. And so mm -hmm. some people would also say, wow, these are crazy life changes in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really feel now I'm living very aligned. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that. And I would like to, if I may, to differentiate a bit. I think for some Please. people there is this calling. But I think many people who are living, as you said, on that edge and they are receiving a lot of positive reinforcement, a lot of positive feedback about it. And they would like to help others have that positive feeling about themselves by bringing those into that same position. And I, as I said before, every purpose is equal. Mm -hmm. and that is very difficult to understand. It's not better to be a world champion than to be a toilet cleaner. Mm -hmm. It's not better to be president of the United States than it is to be that cat out there, <laughs> you know? And we are creating as a society that, that difference mm -hmm. by telling one group of people that they are better, their lives are better, they are admirable, and the others not. <laughs> and I, I am a very passionate about my love for my father, who has decided at a fairly young age, when he became married and had children, to let go of many other things. He was a, an avid motorcycle driver. He had like a tune-up motorcycle and he was driving like, like an insane man. And he was making that decision to say, okay, now I have kids. I cannot drive mm -hmm. life or death. So I just let it go. I, I sell the motorcycle. He had the opportunity to make himself self-occupied and make a lot of money. And he decided not to, to see more of his children. And I think that is very admirable. I think even more so because the decision that I made, people are telling me personally that they don't believe in it, but society is telling me all the time that it's a very good decision, that you should strive to be exactly who I am. And 
nobody is telling anybody that you should strive to be a good toilet cleaner. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a much harder decision to be a good toilet cleaner yeah. or a good gardener because nobody is supporting you in that mm-hmm. decision. And I would very much like to emphasize that point. And to me, that is very, very, very important because many people now, they are excellent gardeners, but they have started to think about themselves as of being in a lower position than people who are in, mm-hmm. a, in a position of fame or money or something else. But if we support those people better in how important their duty is, then they will be in a better position. I very much like to compare the society as a whole or as humans to a clockwork. Mm -hmm. Everybody is equally important. Obviously, we see, you know, like the big indexes, we see them and we think, oh, they are the important thing because without them, the whole watch is useless. It doesn't tell time. But you can take any piece out of it and the watch becomes useless. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't work anymore. So I think that is, that is what I mean by finding your purpose. Mm-hmm. And it is, it is a bit difficult if you have found a calling that's, that's elevating you on a, on a roller coaster of movement. <laughs> to then see that every other calling is equally as, not just important, as useful Mm -hmm. and as admirable. And to somebody like me, I admire it much more because it's very easy to be me. I just do, to be honest, to whatever I please. I stand up when I want to. I came here today because I wanted to. Nobody forces me. Mm -hmm. But to do something that you find boring (laughs) eight hours a day (laughs) i can't imagine Mm -hmm. and people like us who are following that spiritual purpose you know in 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 the core we are also thinking that's the most difficult thing because we are like oh man the buddha he was meditating like all day for 10 years he was sitting there boring like 10 years like like wow but man other men are doing that Mm -hmm. 50 T years, the most boring thing that they can imagine. Mm-hmm. And, and, <laughs> and it's not just boring, it's strenuous as well. Mm-hmm. Some people are working on a construction site 50 years of their lives. And that is an incredible purpose because only because of them, not because of people like you and me, we are sitting here in a warm place. Yeah. And society could, today, they could just put me away and you know, nothing bad would happen. But if somebody stopped cleaning toilets today, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> it would be a shitty problem as of tomorrow. Yeah. I, I like the story or the idea of imagine your government and none of the politicians would work for a month. Mm-hmm. How would your daily life change? Mm-hmm. Basically everything stays the same, but imagine the garbage service, the garbage man would stop working and the trash would pile up in mm-hmm. the streets. <laughs> mm-hmm. That would be a huge yeah. chaos. So yeah. really, who is more important? Like mm-hmm. we, we cannot really judge that actually. Yeah. But there is a lot of conditioning and judgment in the society about the different yeah. positions. Uh, yeah, the different jobs, professions, people. Mm-hmm. I guess that's something we have to collectively overcome because it's also inside of our soul inside of me that I'm still judging people probably not as much as before but there's still judgment in all of things that appear and it's a I see that as a constant training and I think that's Mm -hmm. what a lot of spiritual teachings spiritual teachings are about to Mm -hmm. either see the emptiness and everything or just for me it's just feeling the infinite love of the universe whatever happens so yeah, yesterday I had this uh, moment with this cat here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was packing a box here and he jumped up that cat tree uh-huh. and wanted to play. And we have this toy on the rope yeah. that's like this. And I, I played with him a bit with mm-hmm. the rope and the toy was here. 
But at one point, like he catched my finger <laughs> accidentally. And I was bleeding. I was like, Phew. for for a moment, there was like panic. Oh, now it's bleeding. It's dropping on the floor. And find the band-aid, find the sanitizer. But after some moments, I could relax back into, oh, there's still the universal laugh is still there. Mm -hmm. I can still relax, even though there's the pain and the finger bleeding. Mm -hmm. But I had to catch myself mm -hmm. from this and be just accepting of the moment. Be like, well, okay, I mean, that's how the universe unfolds in this mm -hmm. moment. And yeah, I'm dealing with it. I'm finding the band-aid and the sanitizer mm -hmm. for it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's a constant practice to just accept, mm -hmm. I think, everything that unfolds, accept other people and yeah, be not so judgmental or not judgmental. Yeah. Yes, it has to be constant practice. I think it's a very important realization that everything is practice, whether you consciously are aware of that or not. And danger that many people fall into, I would say, but obviously now I'm judging a bit, is that if you are not aware that you're practicing, then you are practicing unawareness. So many people are very unaware that they are practicing unawareness on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe let's dive deeper into spirituality. <laughs> Where does that come from? And you also ask yourself the question, who is thinking all these thoughts? Mm -hmm. What are your spiritual beliefs? What are your, where do you come from? You mentioned from Christianity, but obviously there are many different levels you can interpret and work with the stories of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, I am a Christian. I'm a Catholic, Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it's a very, very good language to understand spirituality in Christianity. I love the emphasis on do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. And the, the mantra of the monks, ora et labora, to pray and to work, mm -hmm. you know, to not just remove yourself from the world, but you need to work, you need to be here. And that understanding of God as a, as a being, as a conscious being, as a personal God, even that is a person, to me, I think that very close or as close to the truth that we as humans, with our very limited understanding, can come. I think the, the most limiting factor in that spirituality is that we are dumb, so to say. We are dumb and we need to at least glimpse beyond our own intellect, beyond the limits of our intelligence, like the, the ability to recognize patterns and beyond the limits of language. Mm -hmm. and uh, Because we are so much more than that. Yes, yes. And I think we, we can experience that in meditation, for example, in certain practices. You sure, you know that glimpse of the ultimate truth that cannot be expressed in words. It cannot. Yeah, it cannot. Well, I think you, you can use words to point to it, but the words are not the same oh, thing as the actual said. experience. Yes. yes that's exactly. always important to understand because I also share mm -hmm. some meditation videos where I mm -hmm. talk about my awakening perception and mm -hmm. viewpoint. And I think, yeah, it's really important to understand we use words which are a dualistic concept itself we yes. use symbols to point to the actual mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. and the actual experience is something different than the words yeah so language is limited that's why we need to move beyond it mm -hmm. so i very much like that 
Christianity is very much a do religion, you know, do this. And I, I love to do. <laughs> so I, I love that, those practices on how to contemplate, maybe how to experience it, and especially how to treat other people. Mm. I very much like that. And I experienced that spiritual feeling since being a small kid. I, re I remember that vividly. There's a certain points in my life that I remember very much, like being on the hill next to our home and the, the wind was blowing and I felt that, that elevation almost as flying. I was for a moment, I was thinking that if I could just gain a bit more faith, I could take off and mm -hmm. fly away. But I couldn't, but, but, but almost, it almost happened. And I think there's many different ways to that experience, almost like languages. I think today many people talk about which is the right way or the wrong way. And I think that's many times almost like talking about if the correct way to pronounce this object here is if it's a sofa or a couch. <laughs> you know, I was like, ah, no, it's a sofa. No, it's a couch. And I personally phrased that for me, I realized at one point that all wisdom starts with acceptance of parallel truth. Hmm. And you immediately understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. Beautifully yeah. said, yeah. Or Confucius said, if I believe, don't call anybody wise until they demonstrated the ability to look at an object from eight mm -hmm. points of view. Yeah, and that's a skill that is missing in a lot of society today. Even just two opposing views. A lot of people seem to miss the skill to about whatever topic in mm -hmm. politics or everywhere to just truly understand the other person mm -hmm. and one of the things i learned from jordan peterson was if you want to argue with someone you should understand the other person's position better than your own position mm -hmm. you need to argue for them much better than you can argue for yourself because then you can truly understand the other person. Mm -hmm. And just holding two viewpoints, two opposing viewpoints around one topic in your mind, uh, I think it's something that's missing a lot and it's causing a lot of problems today. It is. It would do very good for society if people would just accept that a person with a different opinion, in most cases, they are equally as intelligent as you. They are equally as loving as you. They maybe just put a different weight on specific points of view, on specific goals in the outcome. And maybe it even needs both points of view. I think most people think about life matters like mathematics. They think in right and wrong, <laughs> right? But it's not calculable. Mm -hmm. I think the most important distinction in human interaction is not right or wrong. It's what do you want and what do you not want? And I like to emphasize that very harshly by telling people because they disagree with me. And I'm like, okay, what is the right way to have sex with a person? What is the wrong way? And then I tell them, okay, now think about, do you want to have sex with the person or not? That is, the, that is the important, that is a much more important distinction, right? Between one of the most beautiful things and one of the most heinous crimes. Mm -hmm. So it's a, that is the important distinction. And when Peterson said, we need to understand the other person, that reminds me that I, in, in Germany it's a bit easier. I love to emphasize that most people use their Urteilsvermögen mm -hmm. instead of their Verstand. Mm -hmm. They use their sense of judgment instead of their sense of understanding. Mm. Yeah. 
And when I'm conversing with a person, most of the times I am not in a situation of teaching. I would much rather understand them. And it's very disappointing at times then to learn that the other person doesn't even want to teach me. They acted as a teacher before and when I tell them to explain themselves, they just call me names out of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, I assumed that you come to your conclusion from a process of thinking and of evaluating. And I assume yeah. that you're intelligent and educated. That there is some understanding and something behind it except just the judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then they feel judged. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just want to understand because mm -hmm. I know, okay, some person likes green and the other person likes blue. And maybe I would just like to understand why. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's more to tell about your life story coming to Peter Mettler at age mm -hmm. 33. At one point you opened your dojo and you started to teach. Yeah. Well, so long before then, I, I got into the dojo, mm -hmm. I trained, I become the protege of my teacher back then. Mm -hmm. And he was an amazing person like I've never seen before. It was crazy. The, understanding of martial arts that he had is something that I had never seen before. And the way that he lives his life, I had, I had never seen before. What's his name? Um, Rafael Perlomer. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was overwhelming how, mu how much I have learned from that man who has traveled the world. He has so m seen so many different countries. He has experienced so many ways of life. He was not just a martial arts teacher, but he was also a flight instructor. And only just that balance, you know. And he was not just a master of one martial art. He was a judo black belt, like a wrestling youth Swiss champion, a jiu-jitsu brown belt back then, pro MMA fighter. And I'm like, what is this? How can that be possible? So I've just completely immersed myself and it was incredible how fast I could learn from that man because I think I think learning is one of my most um, pronounced abilities I can learn very fast very good and he had exactly the same body type as I which in martial art is a factor same height same weight very aggressive fighter I've learned so fast and I want championship after championship, fight after fight, traveled the world with him, traveled over 30 countries on five continents with him, fighting there and there and there. And it was, can you imagine at that age, you're like 15, 16, 17, and suddenly you're hanging around with like those 35 year old tattooed extreme men that have everything that a young man may dream of, money, women, everything so it was it was very very extreme he's also a, an avid reader he has read a lot of books and he has a very distinct way of looking at the world um, later on i've realized not just to my advantage but he was in many things the polar opposite of who my father is my father is that perfect example of a godly man. He's a faithful man, very strong and loving. I, it, you really see it in his hands that are huge, like massive. I have big hands, but, but his little finger is thicker than my index finger and they are so strong and so warm that if he holds you, you immediately you feel like a baby. Mm -hmm. So beautiful, you know, and he's always only full of love and truth. He never lies, you know, he never dece deceives anybody. He's only that, all that for everybody else. And Rafael is the complete opposite. He's that, that extreme example of how manliness can be perceived as well. Mm -hmm. um, I would say almost unhinged, you know, with, uh, with women, with uh, substances, with 
travel money, spending money. He had never had any money, but because he's, he's giving it away everywhere, bringing up, finding no value in truth. Because he's like, yeah, well, you can say whatever you want to. Nobody's holding you back. You know, he's like, why, why should I speak the truth? And it was so extreme to experience that time with him and to learn so much of him. And uh, I, could, I could go on for hours, but if you would like to skip to the point where I suddenly, I became a bit more mature. It was easy for a 16 year old, even for me who's thinking a lot, to be distracted by all of that. And I had almost lost my track in truth mm -hmm. by all those distractions. Mm -hmm. So the deal with God, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I've started to lie even. I, I had never lied before. I'd made many bad things, but I had never lied. I started to lie. It was, it's very bad. Once you start lying, you lose yourself. You are not, not just yourself anymore. You're not even actually a human anymore and you open your mind for all of those influences you lose truth you lose reality because for somebody who's rooted in truth reality is an incredibly fixed concept there is no doubt but once you start lying everything is in doubt mm -hmm. everything even yourself even your past everything and there was that's that's very bad i think that is one of the deeply rooted problem as to why so many people feel so bad. And in, in German you say, ich fühle mich gut. And it, mean, it, just, it doesn't mean I feel good, it means I feel myself good. Mm. Because you feel yourself. And it, it doesn't just mean I feel well, but it means the quality of how I feel myself. Mm -hmm. And I very much love that. And if you lose that, you, then you don't feel yourself anymore. But uh, at one point, suddenly I realized he's lying to me too. And I felt so stupid. I've seen him lie to everybody. Mm -hmm. I've seen him forge documents, you know, and I, I've, I've enjoyed that kind of... Um, criminal brotherhood almost, you know, like we were with the health angels and, you know, all kind of shady people even. And if you are in that, then it's like, Haha, it's us, we are the outlaws, mm -hmm. you know, and the others are like, <laughs> and then you realize there is no such thing as criminal honor. Mm -hmm. it, there is not. The criminal is without honor. Mm -hmm. And I felt so betrayed like never before, mm -hmm. even worse than like my ex-girlfriend cheated on me, but that was worse. <laughs> I was like, man, I thought we were more than brothers and I felt so stupid. And recently I've read in the Silmarillion of Tolkien and one sentence was so great. That's how the big thief, um, that's how the big, the bigger thief cheats um, betrays the smaller thief mm. because the smaller thief has thought oh we together can mm -hmm. but no and uh, I've realized that I must go I must shut out that influence from my life and at one point I remember that day as well I was talking to him and he was always full of promises his whole personality is that, and if you fight with somebody, there's a Chinese saying that you don't know somebody in his core until you fight with them. Mm. And if you fight with somebody, you see his core existence. He has to let go of that mask. Mm -hmm. And he, if you fight with him, you always get that feeling of a big threat coming on. There's something something will happen right now. It's mm -hmm. always giving you that feeling. And he's doing that in daily interaction as well. That's, mm -hmm. how, he, that's how he reels everybody in. Mm. 
Yeah, it, seem, it seems that how you do one thing is how you do everything. Yeah. And how you're with one person, you're with everyone. Mm -hmm. So yes. those were just two sayings that seem to apply to this person and also to, I guess, m people who are more, how you say, malevolous, bad mm -hmm. people in general. Yes. And so he had so many people, including me, by with those promises, spoken and unspoken promises of very soon we will have big success and you will get great money and fame and everything you dream of. And I realized, man, and I talked to him, I was teaching for him in Zurich and I talked to him and said, Rafael, I know you've promised that very soon, you know, you will, he told me he will give me 3,000 francs per month for teaching twice a week. Like, yeah, you know you said but that, but I can't wait any longer because I don't have the money for gas anymore. And he was getting angry even. Mm. He was shouting at me. And I realized, man, usually he would say something like, yeah, you know, ah, but it will be very soon, blah, blah, blah. And the thought came that, oh, now we're here. You're not even lying anymore. Mm -hmm. And I realized, okay, he's not even lying anymore. And I realized too that deep inside, I had known that he was lying. He wasn't naive at all. He's always selling the people that, hey, you know, he's just like that head in the clouds type of guy. No, it's pure calculated manipulation. So I had to cut, let everything go again. Right, I traveled the world with him, won championships, I had a huge dojo with him, I had that kind of success. I was the number two next to one of the biggest martial arts influences in Switzerland. We got the TV show, to the newspapers, all of that stuff. And I realized, no, that's, that's not it anymore. I need to let go and do my own thing. So I went back to Schweiz. On that same day, on that same day, I, oh, how to say that in English? I asked my then girlfriend to become my wife mm -hmm. because I realized, okay, now that's, that's my new life, but that's what I do. I went there, I asked her, will you marry me? Oh, and then focused, I opened my school in Schweiz in a, in a shed without heating, without water, with broken windows, without one cent in the pocket. And then we just grew. Yeah, then at one point I realized, okay, now, but now if I want to reach more people, how? School's growing slowly. I started to make a plan. How can I have many schools? How can I reach more people? Okay, I need to, I need to start to understand two things. The economic side of teaching martial arts, which I had actively ignored before. I thought, like, you know, like the real martial artist. It's without money. <laughs> you know, it's a, what a lot of spiritual people think in general, right? It's yeah, such exactly. a bad topic to think about. And yeah. There are so many spiritual people where it would actually help for them to have some more money to be more effective. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now that I finally earn at least some money, I can do things. <laughs> it sounds so stupid. But, you know, back then I enjoyed having no money. You're like a monk, you know, mm -hmm. living day to day. And now I can, I can buy things that help me further my goals. Then I needed to understand marketing. And as well, marketing was a dirty topic to me because to me, marketing had to do with lying mm -hmm. or with trying to manipulate people. And I very much try to stay off it. As I said before, to me, consents and Informed consent is the most important thing. I will never force anybody to anything. Uh, it, it's, it's even something that still very much irritates me when I see men interacting with a woman and the woman displays any kind of not wanting to. Then to me, okay, then it's gone, okay. Mm -hmm. well, but many men, then they try to force and that. To me, that's already... I absolutely cannot understand that behavior. If you don't want to, then okay. Then I don't want to either anymore. Now I don't want to anymore. So, but I want to learn, understand marketing because I realized that most people don't actually know what is martial art. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. How could it help them? They think martial arts is we go there and then we just beat each other up. And they confuse martial arts with the violence that they see. Mm -hmm. right. So I needed to learn to understand that. And that's, that's how I started uh, like the online channels and stuff mm -hmm. to share more about how I view the martial arts to help people understand martial arts and themselves, those people that I cannot reach with my school or people who would like to come to my school and train with me. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I am. Wonderful. Hmm. You, you mentioned the question you are wondering who's thinking all these thoughts. Mm -hmm. What's your answer? Who's thinking all these thoughts? I think that there is a core of existence and, but I think that the soul, how I would say, is something that I cannot actually comprehend. And at the moment, I think that contrary to what many people think, it's, I believe that it's not the brain that allows us that thinking process, but it's the brain that limits it. I think it's mostly a limiting device. The flesh is a limit. Because only because of the flesh of the materialistic world, things need energy and they need time on the physical side of it. So if we remove the flesh, then there is no time and there is no energy. And all that remains is ourself. And I think that is someone I think that is a distinct person. That is what I personally believe. Thank you for sharing this and uh, yeah, also sharing your life story. I think it's super, super interesting to learn to learn this from you because when I see the the short three minute TikTok videos. Um, yeah, I feel like now this podcast really puts together like a whole mm -hmm. holistic picture and, and yeah. story. And I guess we still only have touched on maybe 10% of what we could speak about and share. Is there anything you want to share with viewers, maybe young people listening to this, seeing this? Let me think about it for a mm -hmm. second. No. Okay, no, I think we've talked about a lot and I would like to refrain from giving any kind of advice just out of the ether mm -hmm. to not do just those motivational pieces that are like, yeah, <laughs> believe in yourself. Uh, no, I think what I would like to maybe repeat what I think is the most important lesson out of the questions that I've received today, which is to really gain that introspection into yourself about what can you do? What is your purpose? Without distraction from what society tells you what is best, Find the purpose here on earth and express that. Hey guys, welcome to the end of this video. Give it a thumbs up if you haven't already. And I quickly want to share with you the sponsor of this episode and also a special deal with you. The sponsor is Kion. This is a high quality supplement brand created by biohacker Ben Greenfield. And I love a lot of their products, their coffee, their bars, and especially their essential amino acids called Kion Aminos. And the Kion Aminos are pretty cool because everybody needs essential amino acids. They are the building blocks of your body. 
They help your muscles, your organs, your skin and a lot of things in your body. But it's quite hard to take enough essential amino acids through our regular diet. So I generally recommend EAA supplements and what I love about the Kion Aminos is they use a scientifically proven ratio of the essential amino acids in their capsules as well as in their powder and also the powder tastes amazing. This is my favorite flavor, the mango version of this powder and I just take a scoop of these in my water bottle, uh, take it to Jiu Jitsu practice and right after class um, having like a little reward, this super nice tasting mango flavored essential amino acid water. So yeah, if you want to check out, go to getkion.com and use my coupon code MAXHUG to get a special discount. Thanks for watching all the way to the end and I'm sending you much love. Someone